kind of in the arts, and then I worked as a curator, and then moved to philanthropy. I'm a professor of psychiatry based in University of Sydney. Because I come from an investment banking background. And... Uh, I work as a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst. My day-to-day -day life as, as a pediatric oncologist. So I'm a GP in Australia. And... It's probably the most relevant course of study I have undertaken because there were a lot of things that we were encouraged to think about that are very relevant to contemporary life and to the challenges we all face. So it felt immediately relatable and usable. I think I got the best of philosophy that I wanted, which was really help with how to think rigorously. It was fascinating. That was really what stuck with me, that there wasn't a single session that I can say hand on heart that I didn't enjoy or come away with thinking about something in a fresh way and also having new ideas of my own. I feel it just taught me how to think. Philosophical logic and understanding a sound argument, um, being able to like have that sort of formal approach to, to evaluating an idea, being able to debate in a dispassionate way. It doesn't have to be personal or you know, emotional, it can be this like wonderful exercise. I think my writing is a lot better. It helps in much better formulating arguments in a coherent way. Well, it's not perfect, never is, but um, I think being very concise, using simple English. Every single thing that we, we explored as part of the MST can be applied in some way to what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, one big thing in pediatric cancer treatment we're always thinking about is, is quality of life and, and the impact of our treatments and, and our attempts to cure cancers. How does that impact on a child's life as they move forward into adulthood? And that is directly related to the things we learned about in terms of well-being. You know, what does it mean when we talk about the best interests of a child? I just published a book on ethics for psychotherapists based on what I'd learned uh, during the course. So I, I couldn't have kind of made more use of it. <laughs> I didn't come into the course thinking I was going to write that, but in doing the course, it made me very aware of what was missing in my own profession. So it was wonderful to, to take the best bits that had made most sense to me and try to then export them into my discipline. Many of the things I learned in the course still have relevance to my day-to-day -day practice. Now we have so many issues, for example, with treatment, with forced treatment, with uh, hospitalization against people's will, for example. These are things I deal with day-to-day, -day, but rather than seeing them as tools or, or events or aspects of my specialty, I try to frame them from the practical ethics that I learned. And I apply it at least daily, whether that's in, say, day-to-day -day decisions about patient management, so where, say, you know, the autonomy of the patient is in conflict with maybe a public health consideration, having that framework in your mind in terms of how you talk to a patient, um, I find really helpful. One of the strengths of the course was that you were with very experienced colleagues um, who were applying ethics in their day-to-day -day practice and thinking about it and, and confronted with real life dilemmas where you could see the application immediately. And you were also very challenged because they were very intelligent, very stimulating colleagues to have on the course. So I, I felt that as well as the, the staff, Actually, the colleagues brought a lot um, to the course, and that was a, a real strength. We did form quite a strong um, interpersonal connection and relationships. We felt uh, that it was completely appropriate to really enter into deeper discussion or analysis of the topics at hand. And that, I felt, is really unique in this program. And it was also the foundation of very strong personal relationships for many of us. We have remained in very close contact, which is exciting because uh, not everybody in your life, if you're not a philosopher, wants to have these sort of in-depth, deep dives on these topics. <laughs> we formed some great friendships. And I think even um, when we had academic disagreement it, there was sort of this mutual respect and you'd it'd start in the classroom and then be like consolidated at the pub afterwards. The social side was good. I 
I would say my fondest memory was um, we had a, an like an evening tutorial that was watching a Black Mirror episode over wine and canapes. And I just can't think of a better way to spend an evening, like to spend an evening with your peers and, um, you know, professors in the room, people who are so senior in the field of um, bioethics, watching this like social commentary piece on social media, getting to discuss it and doing it all over wine in this stunning setting. <laughs> Just... Which just happened to be during the final uh, two-week module that I was in Oxford that the pandemic basically became a thing. We went from kind of all being together, hearing about this this pandemic that was, you know, maybe making its way across the world to, to literally halfway through our two-week period of going from being together as a group to suddenly everything online and all of us uh, being in our individual rooms in college. And I think at the time, you know, no one knew what was going to happen and we all thought the world was going to end. Um, but if there was a place to be and a group of people to be around if, if the world was ending, perhaps maybe, you know, your course mates as part of the MST in Oxford was not such a, not such a terrible, <laughs> terrible place to be. So, so what I think I really appreciated was, you know, all all the course conveners are incredibly different. They're all brilliant, but incredibly different in their approach, in their um, in in their way of thinking, perhaps their way of going about philosophical reasoning. You know, they all um, and, and so to be able to learn from all all of them, not only the three of them, but all the, the lecturers, including guest lecturers we had. I mean, I remember you know having people who were guest lecturers and me thinking, gosh, 10 years ago, they were the people that were at the forefront of, you know, whatever I was writing about at the time and to have them then talking to us about, you know, well-being or disability or, or whatever it was that they'd been invited to come back and talk to us. I mean, I know Jeff McMahon gave us a, a talk. I mean, that, that was just incredible, you know, to, to be able to, 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 to see someone in person in the flesh that you'd only read about. And I have been able to listen to lectures from superstars in ethics. I mean, the real rock stars and they're in the room, they're talking about their work and they're, I felt everybody universally was 100% present and receptive to questions and um, very generous in explaining their perspectives, their arguments. I mean, where else do you find that? And not just like one or two, like every other person, every other lecture was the authority in that field. I mean, that just blew my mind. I was like, wow. One really wonderful part of our program, which I which I loathed, I, I really loathed, but was very good for me, was that we, at the end of each module, had to make a presentation. More than one presentation, I found myself arguing a position that was um, contrary to something that Julian had written. And then there you would be in the audience with those arms crossed or the very, irritated look on his face and but but what a wonderful thing to um to to argue against Julian's position you know and and um usually discover you're probably wrong in taking the position that you took but um it was fabulous Julian and Guy and Cesar are very different characters Julian you feel intimidated when he's talking and Guy you feel intimidated when he's silent I think they're quite, quite different in approach. I think all three are really supportive students though. Like the feedback you get on essays, if you're stuck on something or you're asking a question, they always kind of pitch it at the right level so that you can move forward. I, I think that was outstanding actually, to have the three of them there. Guy was my uh, wonderful, amazing supervisor and uh, it was my first formative essay. And I was, I mean, so anxious. I mean, and at the end of the hour, I sort of, my husband said, how did it go? I said, well, we didn't get beyond the first page because it was like, he obviously, well, Guy did very well. So every, define your terms, what do you mean by this? And the level of detail was just extraordinary. I was remembering in a Zoom tutorial, I'd like just gotten my dog d sixed and she was, she'd like just thrown up and I was a bit flustered and like a tutorial was about to start. And then 
um, I kind of had her up on my lap and she had her coat on and Julian starts like waxing lyrical about how, you know, I've limited her reproductive capabilities and like making an animal ethics argument. I was like, when I first submitted the first two essays, I didn't know how to write philosophical essays and some will probably say that's still the case. Then another high point for me was actually to see the debates between staff members as well on, on positions of Dominic and Julian talking about the Charlie Guard um, issues and, uh, and getting very sharp with each other in their debates and, you know, the, the knives are coming out and it, it was really sort of exciting and wonderful, but then all in good fun and everybody goes to the pub afterwards and talks. So it, it was just fabulous for me in that way to see um, ethics, ethical arguments being put together and dismantled and to see them in sort of live, actual time. I mean, it's attracted a very interesting group of people. So it will be fun to be together. It will be fun not to have to write a paper at the end of it. So. <laughs> <laughs>